Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota. Cruising your way next, Off 90. An exploration of the home front during World War I. Rust as an art that you can drive. Folk theater at its finest. Plus, it's high time for a bit of the Irish trad music. Your next stop, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this journey, Off 90. World War I was fought mostly in Europe for four years early in the 20th century. America joined the hostilities in 1917 and fought for the remaining year and a half of the war. Of course, the general population of the country was greatly affected by the conflict. Professor Dean Euland explains what it was like to live in a small town during World War I. I'm Dean Euland, and I'm a historian. Much of my academic and, and personal interests lie in the area of World War I. Uh, a wide variety of topics within the war. I've been interested in it uh, really most of my life. One of my grandmothers grew up in England and I remember tales uh, from her when I was a child of, of uh, experiencing the bombing of the Zeppelins and uh, I grew on from there and over, over the years I've read a lot and, and it's just something that interests me. World War I started in August 1914. Germany invaded Belgium on its way to France. Because of the way the alliance system in Europe was structured, uh, that brought all of the countries of Europe, or all of the major countries of Europe, uh, into conflict. Uh, Britain, France, and Russia on one side, Austria, Hungary, and Germany on the other. By late 1916, Germany chose at that point to unleash its fleet of U-boats, submarines. Uh, they calculated that they could sink enough shipping bound for the British Isles that they could knock Britain out of the war before America could enter the war. Of course, by sinking shipping bound for the British Isles, they were sinking American vessels, uh, American uh, seamen were, were dying. That, of course, was an act of war. President Woodrow Wilson really felt that he had no choice uh, but to seek a declaration of war from Congress, which he got. Uh, and so by early April 1917, uh, the United States was involved in the war. Once the United States Congress declared war, uh, it became the, uh, the intention of the government to make this war belong to everyone. And so there was a great uh, push uh, for everyone to participate in, this, in the way that they could. Whether you were uh, a young man uh, eligible for the draft or whether you were uh, able to grow a garden or volunteer for the Red Cross or raise money, uh, whatever it might be, they wanted a wide participation of citizens to support the war. The other side of that coin, of course, was the fact that they had very limited tolerance for people who didn't support the war. Uh, dissent was simply not tolerated at all. Uh, sometimes dissent uh, got you labeled a slacker. Sometimes uh, uh, by dissenting from some aspect of the war, you might find yourself the subject of an angry editorial in the Herald. Uh, in fact, a man from Freeborn County who had spoken against the war uh, was fined uh, by Judge Catherwood here in Moore County courtroom, uh, fined $500 for speaking out. It was a, uh, a great deal of pressure on all uh, citizens to participate. And to be honest, uh, almost all did. And virtually no uh, examples that I can think of of really unpatriotic actions. It's just that uh, patriotism was defined a little differently perhaps in 1917 and 1918. There was no room uh, for anything but the 
uh, company line, so to speak. We will participate and we will support the war. By the way, there's a story of a Rose Creek uh, gentleman who did not purchase a bond, didn't believe in them, and he was shunned. Uh, he went back, back to town and uh, no one would speak to him. Uh, the sheriff gave him uh, a lecture. Uh, finally, he purchased a bond, and I believe the quote was, he was once again a man among men. That uh, was, uh, again, a great deal of societal and, and governmental pressure to, to conform. When I think of Moore County, w one of the areas that comes immediately to mind is Waltham Township in the area around Waltham. Uh, I think of that because uh, uh, there was a, um, uh, the Trinity Lutheran Church in, I believe, June 1918. There's a notice in the paper of a special program that they were having on a Sunday. We're at pains to note that uh, the service and the program would be conducted in the vernacular of this country. In other words, they, were, they wanted everyone to know, we're speaking English here because German speaking was frowned upon. So, but yeah, I, I, I would say that the uh, Waltham area, the uh, Adams and Johnsburg area had significant populations of folks who were German immigrants or first or second generation uh, German families. The biggest way for Moore County residents to be involved in wartime uh, activities was through the Red Cross. By the way, the Ladies Floral Club uh, here in Austin helped to establish a, a local chapter of the Red Cross uh, shortly after the war uh, broke out. And it wasn't very long before every township and, and community across the county, across Freeborn County, Steel County, whatever, uh, had its own Red Cross organization. Farm help was short. Uh, oftentimes, uh, sons who were working on the farm were volunteered or were drafted, sent to Europe. Sometimes a young man uh, was found himself uh, on the fields of France instead of the fields of uh, Moore County. Olaf and George Dahm uh, were members of Company G of the uh, National Guard. And as I'm sure you know, uh, the VFW post here in Austin is named after Olaf B. Dom. Uh, Olaf Dom uh, tragically was killed in a training accident. A grenade exploded near him uh, at the at Camp Cody in New Mexico. Uh, it, it's written that his brother George was at his side. He was the first one to get to his side uh, after the accident. Uh, sadly, uh, Olaf was killed. Uh, and also, sadly, it was uh, only a day after his parents had left. They had journeyed down to New Mexico to visit their sons and uh, had just left the previous day. When uh, Mr. Dom came home, uh, some 15,000 uh, people participated in, in the last rites. It was a, uh, he was a very popular, well-known young man in, in the community. Charles Earle was the first Moore County volunteer to be killed in action in France. Uh, Earle and the Marines died at a place called Belleau Wood in June 1918, uh, one of the very first uh, major actions of all of, all of the combat operations in, uh, that the Americans participated in. But it's also worthwhile noting that more than half of the soldiers who fell were uh, victims of the influenza epidemic. For every young man who, who died of uh, combat, another young man died of disease. Uh, so, but it's also important to note that when soldiers returned, sometimes returned to the news that uh, their younger siblings who had stayed at home had died of the disease too, because it, it was a very sad time uh, with this uh, epidemic sweeping across the world. World War I ended uh, on, at 11 a.m. on November 11th, 1918. Moore County, uh, Freeborn Steel, the counties that I've studied closely 
uh, all had roughly similar experiences. People volunteered, most people were uh, enthusiastic about doing their duty. Uh, the few people who questioned, uh, even though they were patriots, were not very well treated oftentimes. And so, yes, I believe Moore County's experience was, was a typical one. So, there's this thing called a rat rod. A rat rod is a style of hot rod that exaggerates the style of the early hot rods from the 1950s. Rat rods are a counter reaction to the high priced customs and typical hot rods, many of which are seldom driven and serve only a decorative purpose. Rat rods are definitely decorative, but think less showroom and more Mad Max. Driving down the road there, uh, you look over and they're videotaping or taking pictures of you and it's just, it's crazy. It's fun. Just open your mind. If you want to make a vehicle that's drivable, get it on the highway. You don't worry about the, fat, the finish. You can put any part, anything goes. It doesn't matter what makes a rat rod. You don't have to make a custom hot rod. It doesn't have to have shiny paint on it. The rustier, the better. The crustier, the better. Just make sure it's roadworthy and uh, have fun with it. And you're off limits. It's off limits. Let your mind go wild. The main reason for this show is, of course, it's called Rusty Eyeball, and, and there's a lot of rat rods that are here. They're, we're trying to bring in some more sh shine. We've got the property to bring in some shiny cars. If people can afford uh, to put a shiny car together and they bring it to our show, we'd love to have it here. But most of them are rusty, and most of them are crusty, and we love it. And uh, there's some interesting people. Uh, you talk about their cars, and you find out how they put their car together and where they got their parts. Yeah, some of them are plumbers, and you can tell it. Some of them got brass for fittings everywhere in them. Some of them got the kitchen sink mounted in them. Some got tractor seats in them, and they're legal, and that's phenomenal. Uh, my name is Brad Bonneville. I'm from Floodwood, Minnesota. That's uh, kind of up by Duluth area. My dad had a hot rod, and then I got into racing, and then just love cars and tinkering on them, so just got into it. Uh, I, I found this, uh, the body, it was in a farm field. It was missing the doors, so I just took and welded the front to the back here. Um, the motor tranny rear end was uh, a 1976 Chevy Nova to straight six 250. So I used the motor, the tranny rear end, radiator, master cylinder. Um, bought some two by three square tubing, built my own frame. Bought a front end kit from Speedway. Um, welded it all up, a uh, 55 gallon barrel for the for the radiator shroud. And to hold that in a place, I put a shotgun on here, which actually holds it all together. It's great, I love driving it. I drive it everywhere. And then since there's no doors, the roof actually flips open and I climb through the roof. And then uh, I steer from the right-hand side too, to make a difference. Personal touch. My name is Andy Peterson. I'm from Sauk Rapids, Minnesota. Just like the fact that you don't have to worry about washing them and you can drive them and don't have to worry about people backing into them or, or scratching it at parking lots or wherever, grocery store, it doesn't matter where you drive it. I drive my cars everywhere and they're just fun to drive and you get a lot of looks. This is a 1926 Model T Ford Roadster I built for my girlfriend. I use pretty much all junkyard scavenge parts, the wheels, the axles, the junkyard the motor came out of a junkyard shed laying on the floor. No idea if it worked, but it runs good. The body we found out in a farmer's field in Wisconsin. And then the turtle deck we picked up at a in a pile of parts in a buddy's dad's little storage shed. And I just built a square tube chassis and put it all together and works quite well. A 
Again, my name is Mike Jacobson. They call me Jake. I'm the announcer here at the Rusty Eyeball Car Show, and this is our 12th annual car show here in Wilmer, Minnesota. We're located uh, 100 miles straight west of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, we're coming off of 7. If you're coming down Highway 7 and heading to the west, we're about 15, 16 miles to the north of uh, Highway 7. And uh, it's just a phenomenal event. And we get bigger and bigger every year. I think we're going to stay at the second weekend of July every year going forward. I've got a 56 Chevy pickup I built for my dad uh, when he passed seven and a half years ago and, and the looks I get from that because just I put all airbags in it and the kids love it. I give them rides. My wife is a school teacher. We bring it to the school and let the kids have rides in it on, uh, on their, for the reward weekends and just the lights in their eyes is phenomenal. We don't make any money at this event. I would call it a nonprofit, but we, we have fun at it. We want to continue moving forward. How to Talk Minnesotan was a book published in 1987. The book provides examples of stereotypical Minnesotan speech and mannerisms, don't you know? Soon thereafter, it was turned into a musical play. Recently, it was performed on stage by the Manterville Theatre Company. And oofta, it doesn't get any more Minnesotan than that. Learn how to talk Minnesotan. That's just a fun way to interact with the audience and just the kind of style that people like around here, I think. Humor is best when there's a little bit of reality and a little touch of uh, truth in it. And that you could see even in the bits that were out there, you go, oh yeah, this is going to be a good, this would be a fun one to really connect with a lot of crowds. My name is Sarah Schaller and currently I'm the director of How to Talk Minnesotan here in Manorville at the Manorville Opera House. The Manorville Opera House has been around for 100 years. It's currently a community theater used for melodramas and full-length plays. We're celebrating our 100th year in 1918. It was built and it used to be a speakeasy, so we've heard. So How to Talk Minnesota and Start as a book. And when I was directing, started to direct this, I thought, I don't know if I can relate to this at first. I've heard about it, right? I've heard that some people talk a certain Minnesotan and the more we got into it, the more I started to hear people at the grocery store, people um, that I work with doing some of the, t talking about and, and referencing some of the things that we talk about on the show. So that made me laugh and I thought, oh, this is gonna be fun for everybody. <laughs> Well, we're ready to do the three basic phrases, if you are. Uh, sure. You bet. <laughs> the clerk rings up Russ's marshmallows and his Q-tips. He pays. She hands him his merchandise. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. You bet. <laughs> now, for the second basic phrase, that's different. You are offering an opinion, but you offer no concrete clues as to what that opinion might be, right? The person on the receiving end has to form his own opinion mm -hmm. about what your opinion is when you say, that's different. You bet. Well, one night last winter when Ed was at a school board meeting, I put on a new nightgown that I'd gotten from a catalog called Alluring Designs. Oh. <laughs> Ed walked in the door and said, boy, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, now for quick practice, I want you to turn to the person you're sitting next to and, and take a look at how they're dressed and tell, tell her or him, uh, that's different. Well, yeah. That's, that's different. different. 
That's different. Oh, that's different. Oh, dad. The third basic phrase, whatever, takes over in Minnesota conversation when you bet and that's different, aren't strong enough to express your emotional turmoil. It's whatever. Now, we would like you to respond, whatever, whatever. to these typical whatever situations. <laughs> They're ready to go. You know, you've been an excellent worker at the plant there, bud. For the past 16 years, we haven't had any complaints. But we're going to have to let you go and without your pension. What? We're downsizing. Whatever. So Ed and Lucy Humdy, they run the Lost Walleye Lodge. And that's where this whole show takes place. And they are giving lessons on how to talk Minnesotan. Well, we talk about how Minnesotans like to talk, express their positive of feelings with the negative because, you know, it levels things out. You know, you don't want to get too excited about anything. So we use phrases like, uh, can't complain, not too bad. You bet. Uh, you bet. Pretty good deal. Could Pretty be good worse. Deal. Yeah. yeah, those are the phrases that we're teaching them how to use. <laughs> Tell them when, when your mom calls on the phone and yeah. you say... And I say, I'm fine, and then she gets worried, so then I have to say, not too bad, so she's happy she's, again. she feels good about it all again. Two standing Minnesota men must never face each other during conversation. The angle of the two intersecting lines running parallel to the chest must never be less than 45 degrees. 90 degrees is acceptable. 135 degrees is common, but 180 degrees is the most natural. <laughs> the river falls to Bermarela, burn to Caledonia. The mother tongue will speak with one accord. Talk Minnesota or not. Labeled as the hottest new group out of Northern Ireland, Conla has been quickly making an impact on the folk traditional scene. They have already gathered a big following in the UK, Ireland, Europe, and the USA. Their sensitive and innovative arrangements of traditional and modern folk tunes have helped them create a sound which is very identifiable as Conla. Father, dear father, you've done me great wrong. You've married me to a boy that is too young. I am twice twelve and he is but fourteen. He is young but he's dead in Rome. Daughter, dear daughter, I've done you no wrong. I have married you to the great Lord's son. Early in the morning at the dawning of the day Went out to the field to have some sport and play. What they did there, she never would declare. But she ne'er more complained of his growing. And at the age of 14, he was a married man. At the age of 15, a father of a son. At the age of 16, the grass grew in. And death put an end to his growing. Now my love is dead and the grave eaters lie The green grass goes over him so very, very high I will sit and mourn his fate until I die Now watch your his child
We've reached the end of this episode's tour off 90. Thanks for riding along. See you next time, off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota.